We're going to continue walking through the Gospel of Mark. I want to pray for this message as we get started. Lord, Father, we thank you. We praise you, Lord. We thank you that you've allowed us to walk side by side with your Son through this entire gospel message as we teach it line by line. Lord, I thank you that I was just sharing with a brother in the back that this is the last week of Jesus' life on earth. This is now Wednesday, Lord. And I shared with the brother, I've been grieving for the last couple weeks thinking, I'm going to miss him. I'm going to miss him. And it just helps me to understand, and I pray that it helps, Lord, that, that, that it puts the sense of severity on the body of what the disciples are going to go through, what Jesus is going through. But we thank you, Father God, for come Friday and the crucifixion that three days later is the resurrection and the victory. So, Lord, it is in victory that we share this message today. I pray that every word spoken are only the words that the Holy Spirit allows me to speak. And I pray for the hearts that, are, that have been cultivated through worship and are ready to receive. We praise you, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This has been a wonderful opportunity to walk through the, through the full gospel of Mark. Like I've shared a couple, couple weeks ago, we are, chronologically, we're in the last life, the last week of Jesus' life on earth. Teaching-wise, it'll probably take us through the end of the year. It is that deep. It is that important. Never, ever should Scripture be rushed through. And the one thing that the Lord put on my heart for today's message is that restoration of relationships requires repentance. Amen. Requires repentance. And I know repentance is not popular in, in some of the Western churches today because it means there's sin and there's rebellion and, and that requires repentance. But the Lord requires repentance, so we're going to preach repentance. Restoration of relationships require repentance. And why is this important? That no matter what you've done in your life, God wants a restored relationship with you. But it starts with repentance. I meet people all the time and they say, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You don't know who I've hurt. No, I don't. But I do know God. And I know that God wants a relationship with you more than anything. And I know that that requires repentance. So if we will stand for the word, our anchor scripture, and we will read this together as the body. And this is from our anchor scripture, Mark 12, 1, 2. And it's a parable of the wicked vine dressers. And let's begin. Then he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it dug a place for the wine vat, and built a tower. Then he leased it to the vine dressers and went into a far country. Now at vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dressers. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent them another servant. And at that time, they threw stones wounded him in the head, and sent him away shamefully treated. And again, he sent another, and him they killed, and many others, beating some and killing some. Therefore, still having one son, his beloved, he also sent him to them last, saying, they will respect my son. But those vine dressers said amongst themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Lord, thank you for this word. Thank you for this word. And I know if you're, as you're reading this, you're like, well, that's not very optimistic. But it's what was required. You see, Jesus always knew his destiny. The disciples, probably a little surprised. If you've not read the Gospels, as we continue in, the, in our teachings, you might be a little surprised. But Jesus was never surprised. He always knew this was his destiny. He knew that he came to serve as the final sacrifice for our sins. So let's make sure that the stage is set. Jesus is in what we commonly refer to as Holy Week or Passion Week. 
It is chronologically his last week alive on earth. Sunday, he entered Jerusalem to a huge procession. Hosanna, Hosanna, throwing the garments out before him, crying out. On Monday, he cursed the fig tree because it bore leaves, but it bore no fruit. Because it was, it was a facade of spiritual fruit. It was a fake. And then he went into the temple where he cleared the temple. That was the, that was the judgment on the nation of Israel. Because they themselves, with all their show, had only borne leaves, but no spiritual fruit. And then on Tuesday, Jesus returns to the temple. And remember last week we talked about he was confronted by the religious elites, by the, by the most renowned minds and scholars of their time. And they asked him a question about his authority. And Jesus says, well, let me ask you a question. It was a simple question. Who sent John? God or man. What he did, he put them in between a rock and a hard place. So they put their minds together and they concocted a story and, and, and they just came up with the conclusion of, well, we don't know. You don't know. You're the greatest minds in the, in the nation and yet you don't know. So Jesus drops the mic. Well, then I'm not going to answer your question. See, this is how we're supposed to deal with the demonic world who wants to challenge the eternal word of the Lord. Don't get wrapped up in these, in these ridiculous demonic arguments. The truth is like a lion. You don't have to defend it. Right. Set it free. That's it. Amen. God sent you to win souls, not arguments. So here we are. So Jesus just told this religious elites, well, if you can't answer this, then I'm not going to answer that. Then he's in the temple and he turns. He turns to the people and he begins to teach them including those religious elites. Now, it's estimated, and it's only an estimate, but at the time of, of, this, of this Passover week, there was about 250,000 people in Jerusalem. Pioneers, tra um, travelers, people coming from all over for this Passover week. I'm not saying Jesus was addressing all 250, but there was a lot of people in the temple. There was a lot of attention that was drawn to Jesus. And what he's going to start to do is he's going to start, he's going to use a parable in this situation. He's going to go back to using the parables to teach. And we've learned before, earlier on in his ministry when it began, when he was using parables. See, parables are stories. Jesus is a master storyteller. I'm from the bayous of South Louisiana. We fancy ourselves in being able to twist the tail. But nothing like Jesus. Nothing like Jesus. We're still telling the stories over 2,000 years later. Nobody remembers the last joke I told on Bayou Country. But that's okay. <laughs> Jesus goes back to telling stories through parables. Actually, these parables, these stories, they, they relate to our lives in a very simplistic way. It helps us remember the big picture, so where we sometimes get lost and caught up in the details. Actually, in Matthew, instead of me explaining it, in Matthew 13, Jesus explains why he uses parables. And his disciples came and asked him, why do you use parables when you talk to the people? He replied, you are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given, and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. This is why I use parables. For they look, but they don't really see. They hear, but they don't really listen or understand. Parables reveal the condition of a person's heart. They reveal the condition of a person's heart. I will challenge you that it is not just enough. Hooray, hooray for getting up in hot shower or cold shower and coming here today. Thank you for gathering with the saints. But it's not enough to just be here. These words are meant to pierce your mind so you will transform your minds, Romans 12, 2, so that it will transform your heart. So we're going to walk through this parable, and I want to tell you that there's six main characters in the, in the story. The landowner, who is God, the vineyard, who is Israel, the vine dressers, or the farmers, who are the Jewish religious leadership, uh, the landowner's servants, who are the prophets that God sends to them, the son, who is Jesus, and the other tenants, who are the Gentiles. So 
during the scripture, as, I, as we always put it up and I walk through it, I've inserted those definers just so there's clarity in who we're talking about. So let's begin with Mark with 12, 1, the parable of the wicked vine dressers. Then he began to speak to them in parables. A man, and it's up there, so I won't say God. Y'all see that. A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a place for the wine vat, and built a tower. And he leased it to the vine dressers and went into a far country. You see, this story, this parable is relatable because they're living in an agrarian society. It was all about farming, about reaping and sowing. And that goes back to the garden. It goes back to the very beginning. So when Jesus is telling, maybe if he was telling the story today, it would be about internet or Wi-Fi or coding or something like that. But because this is a, a farming community, he's going to share something based on the agrarian culture. So it got their attention. And you see, it was common because people did produce, they did plant crops with an expectation of a harvest and a, and a, and a profit. Landowners, what they would do, they would enter into covenant with, with vine dressers. And they would lease the vineyards, and then they would split the profits. We call them sharecropping. We still do it today. But it's just basically, it's a sharecropping covenant. The vine dressers, they were entrusted as stewards of the owner's property. I want to ask you, does that, does that still sound familiar? Let me show you where it first began. We go to Genesis 2.15, where it first began. And the Lord God took man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Does that sound familiar? Things don't change. Things always go back to the condition of the garden. Always goes back to the condition of the garden. You see, the concept of allowing others to steward your property for provision and abundance, it's not new. It's not new. Now, I want to take this opportunity to share on Wednesday nights our new equipping series. It's called Healthy Stewardship. It is going back to the original concepts and teaching you how to healthily steward everything that God's first given you, everything that God has entrusted to you. Now, if the board is out, I know we've all got our Bibles, so this is a great opportunity to hear some old-time papers rustling. What a beautiful sound that is. Some old, or on your phones. But we can go to Mark 12, too. Now, at vintage time, he sent a servant, who was a prophet, to the vine dressers, who are the Jewish religious leaders. In, in the Greek, vintage time means right time. That's kairos. That's an opportune time, an appointed time. Kairos represents God's perfect timing. Those are the moments of opportunity that he provides in our life. As an equipping moment, because we are in Ephesians 4, 11, 12, equipping church, it is our job to equip the body to do the work of ministry. Kairos, as we move in faith and we've walked through a couple of seasons in life, we begin to understand the value of of encountering God's timing, God's kairos. You see, time builds character in faith. Time builds character in faith. Yeah, good. That's good. Remember as a kid and it's February and you can't wait for Christmas? Or you just had your birthday and you can't wait for the next? Time builds character. You see, God protects you by using time to develop the character that you're going to need to move into the next season. Right. Amen. I will tell you that 10 years ago, when I was sitting in my chief of police desk, a fat cat pension on the, on the horizon, and the Lord said, get up and retire and come to serve me only. And I thought, that's fantastic. I've been leading men in a command capacity since 1992. Put me in, coach. I will tell you that it was almost a year and a half later before I ever, ever got to minister to any man, anybody. Why? Because I didn't have the character at the time. I would have messed up some people's lives. You see, time protected me in that season of waiting, in that wilderness season, to grow my character into the man that God needed me to be. And I will tell you that it was another five years before he ever allowed me to prepare and share a message. You see, because at the time, 
my character wasn't where he needed it to be. Not that it was a bad character, but it wasn't where he needed me to be. If you're waiting and you're, and you're just grinding it out, wondering when, 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 when God says so, when Kairos, when it's the appropriate time in your life, that's when. Otherwise, you put, a, you put a junior high quarterback in an NFL huddle, it's not going to work out good for anybody. You see, immaturity, immaturity screams, I want it now. I want it now. But a seasoned believer whispers, have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. I will challenge you. Learn to know God's timing. Now let's continue. Mark 12, 2 through 5. Now at a vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dressers. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty handed. Again, he sent them another servant and at him they, through stones, wounded him, wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully treated. And again, God sent another, and the prophet they killed, and many others, beating some and killing some. Do you see the pattern? Do you see the pattern? Now, I know in our, in our natural minds, we're like, well, why do you keep sending people? Just stop. Let them get what they deserve. That's not how God operates. Amen. But do you see the pattern of these religious leaders who have turned away from the love of God and clung to the law and their man-made traditions? You see, as you turn away from God, the further you turn from God, the more your life descends into darkness and violence, even to the point of murder. So many people separate themselves from the church, from the body. Oh, God knows my heart. God knows my heart. Yeah, that's why I want you in His house. That's why he wants you with his people. That's why the word says, do not forsake gathering with the saints. Amen. You don't get this kind of ministry. You don't get this corporate fall of the Holy Spirit sitting by yourself on a Sunday morning, shaking off a hangover or whatever it is. You see the problem? You separate yourself from God. You start to descend into darkness. But let me tell you, God will not stop pursuing you because he loves you and he wants what? Restoration of relationship. But that restoration of relationship requires what? Repentance. Repentance. And let me make it clear. Repentance, not punishment. Not punishment. You see, God loves his people so much that he is patient in calling for repentance. That repentance, your repentance, your confession of sin, it opens the door to the restoration of relationships with God, with your spouse, with your children, with each other. We walk around carrying so many wounds, so many hard feelings against one another because they sat in my chair. That's not the way that God wants us to do relationship, to do life. God loves you. God pursues you. God is faithfully sending his saints to lead you back to him. You see, Israel is so rebellious in their rejection of God. Jesus laments over that. In Luke 13, 34, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her. We have got to come into a posture of lamenting for this nation, for this world, for the lost relationships. God's heart is always for repentance and restoration. Amen. There is nothing that you have done or can do that will stop God from loving you. But you've got to come into repentance. When, when the scripture talks about fruit of the vineyard, and this was our tithing scripture, fruit of the vineyard, in the Greek, it's karpos. 
It means prosperity, fruit of the lips, praise, benefit, profit, reward. God wants your best. God wants your first love to be the relationship with him. God wants your first fruit of the vineyard. Your praise and your worship through relationship. I will share with you. This is Land Yap down in the bayou, Cajun country. Land Yap means extra for free. I'm going to give you a little Land Yap, a little something for free. God wants your first. God wants your first time spent with Him. God wants your first words in the morning. Good morning, Lord. God wants your last words at the end of the night. Good night, Lord. God wants you to be with Him to learn the standard of what it is to be with a godly person. This is why in the Garden of Eden, when God put Adam to sleep, when God put Adam to sleep and he took, the, he took the rib out and he created woman, we don't know how long Adam was asleep. It was not an outpatient procedure, I will guarantee you that. He was split open in a covenant agreement. We don't know how long Adam was asleep. But what we do know is that it was only Eve and it was only God the Father. You see, her time with the first man in her life was her first fruit, was God the Father. That was to show that sister what a godly husband should be, what a godly man should be. God's first time, Adam's first time with anybody was who? Can you imagine Scott Holbert shared this with me years ago? And he formed him from the dust of the earth and he picks him up and he breathes in his nostrils. Some, sometimes I'll ask Max, did you brush your teeth? And he'll come blow on my face. And I go, Beautiful, delicious. But what it takes to breathe into someone's nostril is to be face to face with that person. Yes, amen. You see, Adam's first fruit encounter was with God also. Let your first fruit encounters be with God. Amen. Let the fruit of your lips be the car posts. How many times has God directly moved in your life and yet maybe you rejected him? Maybe you ignored him. Maybe you gave the first fruit of your vineyard to some false god or false idol. If you say karma, stop. Stop. Stop saying the word coincidence. There's no such thing as coincidence. It is God's divine alignment. It is God's timing. It is kairos. Give God your first fruit your first praise. You see, God chose Israel as his own people, as an example to all the world that he is the one true God. Yet in trying to restore them into a relationship of righteousness, they killed the prophets that God sent to bring them back into a revival. There could not breathe. Everybody wants to go to these revival concerts and these revival conferences. Revival requires repentance. Come on, amen. God is trying to bring the nation of Israel into repentance for revival. God's trying to bring you into repentance for revival. I want to ask you, who has God sent into your life to ignite the fire of revival? God will not stop sending his prophets into your life to bring you into repentance so he can ignite the flames of revival. What I will tell you, church, stop killing prophets. Stop killing the prophets. Every time you ridicule, you gossip, you rumor, you slander somebody. Somebody that God has sent to share his word with you. You're killing prophets. You're killing prophets. Now I want to give you some examples. I want to make this real. Because we're going through the, we're going through the parable and, and we're saying he and they. And, but I want, they're going to put a list up and I'm not going to read it. I'm not going to read it. One of our youngest kid, Graham, when he was very young, every, for supper we'd all read the Bible together. And, and Graham, when he was about eight or nine, would say, I want to read the hard names. And we're sitting there waiting for our supper, and he's like, Mikel, Mikel's, let's pass. So I'm not going to read this. I'm going to ask Keaton and him to just put this list up. These are some examples of the prophets that God sent to bring repentance and revival. These were people that were killed for the nation of Israel. These were people who were killed for you. I want you to see an example of real life people just like us who were sent by God and were killed because they were prophets trying to bring repentance for revival. So you might ask, well, that's a lot. 
That's a lot of wasted lives. I will tell you, that is not a wasted life. There is no life better spent than a life serving the Lord. We say, why bother? Why would all these prophets put their life on the line for people who are just going to reject God? I will tell you, agape. Agape. They love other people because God first loved them. You say, why should I bother sharing the gospel? Why should I bother talking to that coworker? Why should I bother talking to that neighbor? What if God said that about you? Why bother? I see what you do. Agape. Because God loved these prophets sacrificially and without limits. God loves you sacrificially and without limits. God wants you to love others sacrificially and without limits. God will not give up on you. We are called by God to be sent out to share the gospel to a lost and dying world. We cannot be afraid of those who kill prophets. You see, I will tell you, if you look at this, this election cycle, and this is just a cultural example. This isn't talking politics. But if we're going to talk governance, it's okay. Because the kingdom of God is a governance system. I'm so sick and tired of the weak Western church. You can't talk about government. What is the kingdom of God but a government? But the example I want to share with you. You look at social media and they were silencing you. They were silencing us. Well, you, if you say this, it's a dog whistle for that. And if you say this, what you really mean is this. And they get you so confused, you're afraid to say anything. You're afraid to say anything. What they're doing is they're killing prophets. When they silence your testimony, when they silence your witness, even if they water down your witness, they're killing prophets. Let me tell you, Philippians 1, 20, 21 says, For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or die. For to me, living means living for Christ. Dying is even better. Amen. To the natural world, they say, well, how can dying be even better? To the, to the supernatural world, we realize the second we pass, we're immediately in the presence of Jesus Christ. We understand that John 3.16 does not mean <clears throat> that we've got to wait until we die to begin, begin eternal life. The instance you receive Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, your life of eternity with God began that instance. Why? Because immediately the indwelling of the Holy Spirit Amen. moved into your life. If you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are living your eternal life right now. The only difference is going to be is when you pass away, this skin suit is going to go in the ground, but you're going to continue living your eternal life. So to die should not be fearful. So this is God's ultimate attempt at reconciliation from Mark 12, 6, 8. And again, the, the, the descriptions of who they are is in the scripture. I won't read that, but you can see it on the board. Therefore, still having one son, his beloved, he also sent him to them last, saying, They will respect my son. But the vine dressers said amongst themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and cast him. They cast him out of the vineyards. You see, these are the Jewish religious leaders. They're plotting. They're scheming. The same law, the same law of God that these religious leaders, they cling to, the Pharisees, are the same law that they're trying to use to weaponize against God's own son. They're, they're trying to concoct something so they're legally justified. You see, at the time, if there was no heir, Whoever the property was in the possession of received possession of the property. We still say that sometimes. Possession is nine-tenths of the law. So in their minds, they're concocting this convoluted story outside the will of God. Well, if we kill the last heir and we're on the property, we get to keep the property. That's demonic. It's got nothing to do with God's love or God's will. You see, just like the vine dressers plot to murder the landowner's son, these religious elites, they were also plotting. They had already plotted to kill Jesus because they wanted to keep their earthly favor and their earthly privilege. 
You see, they became so hard-hearted and blinded by carnal pride that they failed to see the living, physical manifestation of the Old Testament Scripture being lived out before them in Jesus Christ. I want to share with you, this is another equipping moment. This is an equipping moment as you go forward and you're doing the work of the ministry. You see, the religious leaders, they didn't start out like that. The Pharisees, I know we want to, we want to kick on, we want to all, you know, but they didn't start out like this. You see, when the nation of Israel was conquered and then the diaspora, which means they were sent out, they took all the brightest and the best of Israel and they sent them out all across the world because that's the best way to kill culture. If I get everybody who's like-minded and I can send them out into pagan lands, they're going to forget Scripture. They're going to forget prayer. They're going to forget culture. They're going to forget God. And I will say that's what happens. That's what happens. But these Pharisees, they said, we are going to withhold the traditions. We're going to withhold the Torah. And if you remember, the Torah are the first five books of the Bible, also Pentateuch, which is Greek, pente means five, the first five books. These Pharisees didn't start off as bad guys. It happens slowly. It happens slowly. You see, it's a weird analogy, but maybe it's just because I'm, I'm lived on the bayous all my life. You know how to boil a frog? Slowly. Slowly. Gradually turn up the heat. Gradually turn up the heat. Before you know it, you're cooked, dude. You're cooked. I want to tell you this happens to us. You miss a little church. You stop reading your Bible. You go back to your old padnas from the, from the old days. Before you know it, you don't even realize. You don't even realize how hard-hearted you've become. You don't realize that you veered off the path. You don't realize that you've rejected God. But then what you'll start doing is you'll start blaming other people. Like the Lord's put on my heart, we've got to get bold and we've got to just tell people. I love like Don Sarlo will post it. He's like, you get to church. You get to church. Men, you get to church. You be a 1 Corinthians 16, 13, 14 man. God tells you, be strong, stand firm, be a man. But in all you do, do in love. There's such a press on my heart to get to church. But you see what we start doing when we find ourselves in a little separation? Well, they hurt me. What church hurt you? Unless the building physically fell on top of you, that church did not hurt you. Now, it was a knucklehead, and maybe they should come into repentance also. But don't let the actions of somebody move you from the presence of the body of Christ. It was repentance then. It's repentance now. So now, I want to go through this. I'm going to get away from the Gospel of Mark, and I'm going into the Gospel of Matthew 21, 40 through 43. Because what it, it's, the same, it's the same interaction. It's going to give you a, a fuller picture of Jesus' interaction with the leaders. So Matthew 21, 40, when the owners of the vineyards return, Jesus asks, what do you think he will do to those farmers? Now, he's asking these, these Pharisees, these religious elites, he just described the whole scenario of killing and casting out and, and even taking the, the owner's son. And Jesus is like, what do you think the owner's going to do when he comes? What Jesus is doing, he's flipping the script. He's asking the question back to these smug religious leaders. He's forcing them to declare their own miserable fate, which is condemnation for blatant disobedience. You see, they had to answer because they were the experts in the law. So they replied, Matthew 21, 41. Well, they said, well, he'll put the wicked men to a horrible death. Oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> he will put the wicked men to a horrible death. You see, these religious leader, the leaders, this is what they replied. But you see, they had to put on this act because they're very religious and they're very pious. And everybody's looking at them for answers. So they're men of the law. So what else could they say? Well, according to the law, they will suffer a horrible and wicked death. But you see, these fake ponies, these fake, what are they doing? They're already plotting to kill Jesus. This is what happens when you're all leaves and no fruit. It's a facade of spiritual fruit. They had to walk it out. They had to double down. 
they had to continue with their religious facade. They had to pretend like on the outward that they cared about justice. When in their hearts, they were already plotting to kill Jesus. Remember, this is Wednesday. On Friday, they're going to kill him. But you see, these old boys, they also, they unknowingly, they made a prophetic declaration. In Matthew 20, uh, 21, 41, it continues. And lease the vineyard to others who will, uh, who will give him his share of the crop after each harvest. They didn't realize they were just prophetically making a declaration that God was going to open the kingdom up to the Gentiles. It would curl these Pharisees' hairs to realize that the Gentiles, who they have learned to hate and despise, were about to be grafted into the same vine. You see, because of the Holy Spirit's conviction, well, what I want to tell you, these Pharisees, these religious leaders knew that they were in rebellion. They knew that they were wrong. And they had an opportunity. It's like we do when we have an argument with our spouse. Do I say I'm sorry? Or do I ride it out and see who gives in first? These old boys were going to ride it out. They were going to ride it out because they were already separation from God. And I want to tell you in our own lives, because we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, we know when we're in sin. Right. We know when we're in sin. That's right. You cannot tell me, oh, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to be doing that. Seriously? Seriously, get off that URL at night. That pornography is not good for anything. That kills you. Right. Oh, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to be doing that. No, you know because of the Holy Spirit. Intellectually, you may not be aware of it, but convictingly by the Holy Spirit, you know when you're in sin and you feel that separation of God. You get a choice. You get to make a choice to either repent and return or cling to the guilt and endure the consequences because there are consequences for sin. You can choose to go through the facade of being blameless, just like these religious leaders, but that doesn't make your relationship with God whole. Matthew 21, 42, Jesus continues. Then he said, then he asked him, didn't you ever read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it's a wonderful thing to see. When Jesus says, didn't you ever see, read the scriptures? You talk about an insult. Jesus is turning up the flame. He's asking the Pharisees, didn't you ever read this in the scripture? Do you know what it took to become a Pharisee? One of the basic, you had to memorize all five books of the Torah. All five books of the Torah. as Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. That's Numbers and Deuteronomy. In the original Hebrew language, that is over 124,911 words. Can you imagine memorizing 124,911 words? But that was the bare minimum to be a Pharisee. And yet Jesus challenges him by saying, what? Hey, did you ever read that in the Scripture? What he was letting him know is that you might, you might have read Scripture, but you sure ain't living Scripture. Come on. Come on. And when Jesus quotes about, um, now the stone the builders are rejected has now become the cornerstone, Jesus is quoting Psalms 118, 22, 23, but he's applying it to himself. You see, they know that they're going to kill him. And Jesus knows that they're going to kill him. Now Jesus wants them to know that he knows that they're going to kill him. But he's not afraid because that's his destiny. Because that is the only way we know victory. Amen. Is that Jesus walked it out. Because in his, in his death, Christ is the foundation. He's the what? The cornerstone. And then Jesus pronounces the consequences of their judgment. I want you to understand that there's consequences for your sin. God loves you. God forgives you. But there's consequences for your sin. I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation that will produce the proper fruit. That is the Gentile nation. This is us. Would you agree that we are producing the proper fruit? Would you agree that we are producing the proper fruit? When we come and we worship the Lord, when we come and praise the Lord, we are producing the proper fruit. We are producing the proper fruit. Why? Because we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us and we're producing spiritual fruit. You see, at this point, Jesus is not talking in parables. He wants them to 100% know where they stand in judgment. 
Their sin has caused them to be left out of the kingdom of heaven, individually and as a nation. Like time has run out, and the vineyard will be given to other tenants. That's the Gentiles. God will now use new people to temporarily, re temporarily replace the Jews so Jesus can establish his church. This is what we are here today. We are the church, the capital C. The capital C. And Kurt, if you want to come up. And I want to finish with this. We're going to continue the scripture. Mark 12, 12. And they sought to lay hands on him, but feared the multitude. For they knew he had spoken the parable against them. So they left him and went away. Remember, let's go back to the word multitude that's used this time. What is the Greek word that's used this time for multitude? Aklos. What does aklos mean in the Greek? It means a confused crowd, a confused multitude. Do you recall on Sunday when Jesus is triumphant entry, it did not use the word aklos. Why was Sunday's crowd not confused and Wednesday's crowd confused? Because Sunday, they are looking at Jesus. Sunday, their all eyes were on Jesus. There's no confusion in your life when your eyes are fixed upon King yeah, Jesus. Amen. Amen. But here we are Wednesday. And the Greek specifically uses the word aklos. This is a confused multitude. Why? Because their eyes are no longer on the Christ. Church, I share with you. If there's confusion in your life, if there's timidity in your life, if there's anxious and anxiety in your life, fix your eyes on the cross. Fix your eyes on the Christ. At this moment, in this encounter, the gloves are off. Both sides knew what was coming. Of course, Jesus always knew his destiny. And as bad as the religious leaders wanted to kill Jesus, they had no authority to do so. You see, they only had the authority that the Roman Empire gave them. And capital punishment was beyond their capability. So they were going to begin to concoct a crime, a false allegation. As a note, these religious leaders might appear mighty. They might appear strong. Do you have a Goliath in your life? Do you have a giant in your life? Do you have an insurmountable wall that you can't overcome? What I want to tell you, without God's exousia, without God's legal authority to operate in power, these religious leaders, they're just manipulators. Your Goliath is just a manipulator. That bad boss or that bothersome coworker, or that bully little student is just a manipulator. They are not operating in the exousia, in the legal authority that God gives them. You see, these religious leaders, they appeared mighty, but let me ask you, what did they do? It said they fled from him. You know who else flees from Jesus? The demons. The demons flee from Jesus. The demons will flee from you when you declare the blood of Jesus Christ, when you declare the power and the authority of Jesus Christ over your life. Believers do not flee from the lies and the, and the attack of the enemies. We are commanded to do what God has told us to do when we're faced with Satan's attacks. And I'm going to ask us, this is going to be our prayer out. If we would stand and let me declare this word to you from Ephesians. I want to be a good steward of time. So we're going to, we're going to, we're going to pray this over you. I will ask you to close your eyes. Nothing magical or mystical or traditional. I just want you to create some space space of intimacy for you and the Holy Spirit. I don't want you distracted by what's going on on either side or in front of you. And I am going to declare this order, this marching order, yes. this assurance of what you are to do in the face of the attack of the enemy. So Lord Father, I pray this over this body. I pray this word of scripture over the body. And it comes from Ephesians 6, 10, 13. It is the whole armor of God. Lord, I pray for this body that they, did, that they receive these words, that they receive these words. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness, in the heavenly places. Therefore, church, take up the whole armor of God 
that you, believer who is mighty in the Lord, has the legal authority to exercise the power of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Church, I encourage you to stand, stand, stand. As believers, God has adopted you into the vineyard because of the wicked vine dressers rejected his son. Church, I challenge you. Have you have you treated Jesus like the wicked vine dressers? Have you been a good steward of God's vineyard and produced kingdom fruit? I will challenge you that if there's been any sin of rebellion or disobedience towards God, to simply repent yes. and return to the restored relationship with God the Father. Amen. There is a Hebrew word called teshuva. Teshuva. And that means restored to the original condition. God the Father wants to restore you to the original condition of relationship that he first had with you in the garden. That requires repentance. So Lord Father, we thank you. We praise you, Lord. Lord, I pray pray that that as the Spirit moves amongst this body, that that you will compel anyone that has not received your Son as their Lord and Savior that you press upon their heart to make that decision today, that they are welcome to come and make a public profession, or they are welcome to meet with with myself or, or one of the elders, Scott or Joe Hernandez, immediately after service. Lord, I pray that that you put that on someone's heart if they've not received your son, Jesus Christ. We pray as a body that they do not walk out of this house without the covering of the blood of the Lamb. Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for the, for the movement of the Spirit, Father. I thank you for the good word in the Gospel of Mark. We thank you for the courage to be bold. We thank you for the armor. We thank you for the opportunity to go forward and grow the kingdom. Father, we love you. We praise you. We honor you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Mm, amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus.